the exotic situation and the um, choices that countries face that are free of foot and mouth disease and if they have an outbreak, what do they do in an emergency situation? So, of course, one of the biggest questions during your control um, decision is whether you're going to vaccinate or not. And if you vaccinate, then whether you are going to remove the animals or not. And a lot of that is based on the fact that there's a, a, a difference in, oh dear, sorry, a, a difference in waiting period. Um, if you don't remove your vaccinated animals, you have to wait six months um, before you can regain your disease-free status. And that might have an economic impact. Now, the other big question, of course, then is what vaccine um, would you use? Because we all have, well, the, the free countries, most of us have um, vaccine banks. We have a very limited number of strain in those banks. And you have to make the decision on what strain would be the best to use in the situation. Now, a lot has been said about the in vitro matching and then, of course, the in vivo matching. Now, both of these have um, advantages and disadvantages. The big advantage of the in vivo matching, of course, is the fact that you are basically challenging animals um, having been vaccinated with the virus that you are concerned about. And it's still seen as the gold standard. However, it's also um, plagued with difficulties such as lack of variability, um, it's incredibly costly, and it's not really a method that you can use in the face of an outbreak because there's no time um, to first do an in vivo test before you can decide on what vaccine to use. So even in our situation, we are reliant on the R values. Now, um, being an emergency vaccine, of course, Australia will be relying on a six or greater than six PD-50 vaccine. So it is a high potency vaccine. And the big question, of course, is how well does your R1 value actually predict protection when you are working then with a high potency vaccine? Now, in general, um, when we look at VNTs, um, we say that a cutoff of about 0.3 is indicative of protection or not, above 0.3 being predictive. If you use ELISA, you have more of a um, sort of a, a, a range where you're looking at. Now, with our collaborators in um, the uh, regional reference lab in Pak Chong, we have been using the ELISA. So some of the data that I'm presenting will be based on the ELISA. So you have the, the different um, categories. Now, Don showed this, this this morning. And that's one of the problems that all the free countries are being faced with, is sort of the constant development of new um, strains and new situations and new spread. And certainly for Australia, one of the biggest concerns is the fact that the O-India 2001D lineage has now also appeared in Southeast Asia, which means that we need to be protected um, against potential incursions. Now, with the work that we did with um, our collaborators in um, Pak Chong, what we found when we were looking at viruses that have been circulating since about 2013, 2012, up to now in the region, and we look at the vaccine strains that are normally included in the vaccine bank, and in this case, O1 Manissa, what we find is that actually quite a low number of these isolates um, give an indication that there will be protection if we have an incursion from one of those viruses. Most of them are either intermediate or else it has a very low R1 value. We also found the same with the O3039, although the um, intermediate was slightly um, sort of more promising um, with this particular strain. So um, I thought um, we have done quite a lot of, of, of challenge studies, but um, because this is of particular interest um, for what's happening at the moment is, of course, the fact that um, the oh, India, oh, um, India 2001 lineage is, is a worry. And what we found is um, when we challenged the animals at um, seven days post-vaccination, if you have a monovalent O3039 vaccine, um, we got a 60% protection. And with a bivalent O3039, O1 Manissa combination, um, a slightly better protection. Although based on the low numbers of animals that we've used, there's not real statistics um, difference between these. However, if we look at 21 days post-vaccination, we found similar protection between um, the two um, different formulations that we've used. Now, there will be more details on this um, tomorrow in a presentation by Nagendra Singhanulur, and you're really welcome to come and, and listen to that. 
Now, with the A's as well, and we know that A is inherently more variable, and although I'm not showing it um, in the balloons, um, if I had shown the balloons, you'll see the same problem that with the viruses that are currently circulating in Southeast Asia, most of the vaccines will not protect against um, disease. But again, with the vaccine strains that are available, if you look at um, A Malaysia against um, a Vietnam isolate of um, 2012, um, we got 100% protection at 21 days post-vaccination. And that is despite the fact that the, R, oh, that the R1 values are actually incredibly low. And it's, oh, I can find the right one. No, oh, gee, too many buttons. So um, we have incredibly low R1 values, but still we found 100% protection. Now, I have to also add to this that most of these animals have seroconverted to NSP, so although they were clinically protected, they were not protected against infection. Um, one of the experiments that we did that was of particular interest to us is also then looking at a combination of the A um, isolates or, or vaccine strains. Now, um, the vaccine manufacturers don't really recommend this um, for an emergency situation. Um, so normally it is a monovalent vaccine. And if one then looks at um, the results that we found in pigs, when we looked at the monovalent um, vaccines and a challenge against a, a, a very sort of a recent Thai, Thailand virus, we only found 20% protection with the monovalence. But when we did a combination with the two vaccine strains, we increased the protection in pigs to 80%. Um, with Asia 1, and again, despite the fact that there was a very, very low R1 value, um, we found um, at 7 and 21 days post-vaccination, 100% protection in sheep. So it's very clear that when one looks at these high potency vaccines, it's really nearly impossible to use your R1 value as a predictor of whether or not your vaccine will work. Of course, we need to also consider that with the in vivo challenges, there are lots of factors that impact on the results. Most of these experiments are based on very small numbers of animals. So, um, your statistics are, are often fairly complex to try and work out. Um, the facility design can even have an impact on the way that you design your study. Um, the, the challenge route, of course, is incredibly important. With a lot of these studies, you do a direct inoculation, which is, which is not the natural way an animal will become infected. So it is rather difficult to try and extrapolate the information that you get from these direct challenges to what will happen in the field when you have a farm. On the other hand, because you have such low densities of numbers in your animal facility, does that really equate to what will be happening on a farm where you may have a much higher density of animals? So it's very, very difficult to extrapolate these findings always to what will happen in a real life situation. So just to put it in conclusion, um, what we can certainly say is that a poor match in vitro does not necessarily equate to poor protection in vivo when you are looking at high potency vaccines. So it's very important for countries that are currently free of the disease to also rely on monitoring what is going on in the field, um, working with the endemic countries to try and um, ensure that we know more about the epidemiology so that we are better prepared to make a decision if we need to choose a vaccine. One question that I sort of want to put out there as well is, especially in these emergency situations, is there any value in maybe combining more vaccine strains? Now, naturally, that makes the vaccine much more expensive. But if you are a country free of disease without vaccination, maybe that cost is actually very little compared to the overall cost of controlling and eradicating the disease and getting your disease-free status back as quickly as possible. What our data um, have shown, and of course, which I can't show in 10 minutes, is the fact that although these animals were sometimes protected against clinical disease, we did find seroconversion to NSP. We also found instances where there was sterile protection with absolutely no um, serological response post-challenge. We also saw that most of these vaccines work pretty well in cattle and sheep, 
but unfortunately not that well in pigs. So it is possible that we need to look at alternative approaches um, to use vaccines in pigs to improve the efficacy of the vaccines in pigs. We also saw that the time of challenge uh, or the time of challenge post vaccination will be very important. Now, obviously, again, for a country that's free of disease, it's very important to know how soon after protection will my animals be protected. Oh, soon after vaccination will my animals be um, protected. So if we give them the three weeks that we normally um, give before we challenge animals, there's a vast improvement in the efficacy of the vaccine compared to earlier time challenges. And whether one should in increase the, the sort of antigen dose to try and um, make that period shorter before you get full protection is, of course, another question that's also um, difficult to answer because there's cost involved in all of these decisions. So that's just a very, very brief summary. Um, what I've forgotten to mention is that there will be a talk on, on the work in, on Asia One that we've done by Jacqueline Horsington, which will happen tomorrow. And um, we have a vast number of collaborators that we need to thank for all the results that we've generated over the last six years. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Vilna. Um, I think Satya was probably first. Thank you very much, Vilna. Uh, you have done a uh, lot of uh, animal experiment, um, which will give us uh, enough uh, science uh, uh, to think about, about the protection. Uh, one clarification I'm asking, when you have done uh, individual vaccine, or uh, the monovalent, how much uh, uh, antigen payload you have taken? And when you have done combined vaccine, same antigen payload, or you have doubled the strength for the two monovalent vaccine you joined? I see Cedric here, because uh, Mariel did the um, preparation for us. Monovalent will be greater than 6PD50. I'm um, not sure. No, I'm not asking about the PD50. Suppose uh, oh, for okay. the monovalent, you have taken six uh, microgram, like we take for uh, a, a yeah, no, no, I, I know what you, So you're asking whether it's half, half when you um, do a combination. So uh, later on, when you combine it, it's 336 yeah. or 6612. So that I'm saying yeah, antigen yeah. payload, are you increasing to double? That's why you got more protection or taking the same antigen payload, three yeah, microgram, yeah. three microgram, you got 80% protection. That is my question. If you have yeah. increased the antigen payload, then usually yeah. you will get more protection. Yeah. Uh, no, so it is you, usual. Uh, yeah, actually yeah, then, then my question yeah. will be using same individual vaccine, whether you can increase the uh, payload to two times and get the full protection. Nagendra, can you remember? Let's see this on your eye. Double. Yeah. Double. So it's then, double. Then it is not necessary to take two strands, and one strand you can, can do just increase. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely had a question. Um, the, <laughs> um, yeah. No, I've remembered it now. So, so when you were talking about um, uh, sterile, Im sterile immunity versus subclinical infection um, for, for some of these animals, I was, uh, in an endemic setting, I was wondering whether it's actually desirable to have sterile immunity because um, if the, I, I, you know, I don't do this stuff, but I kind of speculate that, uh, does it make sense that if you, if you get subclinically infected, your titers are going to increase uh, against the virus and you're going to have a longer lived protection than you would have done if you just had sterile immunity and the vaccine wears off as it normally does. You see, one of, one of the things that, that we don't know exactly is how much your challenge method actually Im, um, impacts on the results that you find. So when we say sterile immunity, um, that is uh, quite often an animal that's been directly inoculated. But I mean, maybe you will find more sterile immunity if you don't do that direct inoculation, but I, I see what you mean. It, it might be better to have subclinical infection because then you have a, a higher teeter. And that our data won't be able to tell you because it's based on two small numbers and because you're not in a natural situation with a natural challenge route. There's a... 
Okay, I think there's quite a few more questions I would like to ask one myself, but I think we're going to have to finish for the moment. Okay, Najendra, you can speak loudly, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have to move on to the 